Let's get a big round of applause for Michael Hausenblas, please. Thanks a lot, Mark. Good afternoon, Amsterdam. So, my name is Michael Hausenblas. I'm a developer advocate at Mesosphere, but I'm not going to talk about Mesosphere and also not on the wonderful DCOS open source project I'm working on. I'm only talking about serverless or serverless less server, um, trying to come up with a very clever title. But I want to have a really open and frank discussion about what service is good at, uh, motivating you to use it, but also where uh, not to use it. Enough about me and serverless. Quick show of hands, please. Who is a sysadmin? Some folks, all right. AppOps or DevOps role? Okay, cool. Developer, good old traditional developer. Okay. QA, test engineer. We don't do QA. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Data engineer, scientists, data scientists. A few, okay. Last but not least, architects. It was hide somewhere, look at that. Oh, wow. All right. And the rest of you are here for smoothies and other things. Okay. T-shirts. T-shirts, <laughs> Very good. All right. Let's um, dive into it. So if we look at how we roll, and by that I mean how we used to, probably in many organizations still do, write and deploy applications or services, it looked a bit like that. So you have on the one hand, you have developers. They code out stuff. You have ops folks that take that code and run it in production, usually. So you would have, as an entity, a physical server, and pretty much the whole control, be it allocation or whatever, would be on the ops side. So the developers would be kind of happy to throw the stuff over the fence and run away. Right? They, they're not the ones who get paged. Essentially, nothing changed much when we introduced virtual machines. You might be able to spin up a virtual machine on your, on your laptop or whatever, but still, the overall control in the production environment would be on the ops side. This has, I would say, <coughs> changed, changed a bit for the better uh, with containers, right? Now you get to run whatever you want to on your laptop and with certain guarantees that whatever you run on your laptop also looks the same in production. The question is, is that the end? Is there anything beyond that. And with that, I hope to motivate also this, this tendency that dev and ops are converging, um, what comes next, and that is serverless. So let's have a look at the, the whole spectrum of compute styles. You would have this monolith with uh, a unit of execution or provisioning being a machine, so that would be your traditional three-tier app. You'd have microservices, where typically the unit of provisioning uh, and compute is a single container. You would have things like Docker, and Marathon, Kubernetes, and so on and so forth. You would have the PaaS, which has already been around for quite a while, but at least in my opinion, never really took off as much. So you would have a set of things, typically objects that you manipulate, and uh, examples of Heroku, uh, AirBenching, and so on. And now, in the last two years or so, we have this new paradigm called serverless. Here, the unit of compute is actually a function, and the kind of uh, yeah, trailblazing example here is AWS Lambda. But if you think about it, there are other examples that you could consider templated, limited environments like IFTTT. Uh, while I'm making the point is that the pattern is actually the same. You've got some kind of event, and you want to react to that. More to that in a moment. Let's first step back and ask ourselves, in terms of agility, how quickly can we actually get a new feature or a bug fix out into production? Probably agree that it looks some, something like that. The more you get on that serverless end, the faster you are able to push out new features. <coughs> Maintenance looks pretty much the other way around. You have a lot of effort, for example, think of actually putting a physical machine into a rack in a, in a data center versus a serverless function that uh, takes minutes or, or seconds to provision and execute. And cost per unit, pretty much the same, right? 
you would be dealing with uh, relatively low utilization. And uh, things like virtual machines and so on have certainly helped uh, increase in utilization. But at the end of the day, you're essentially paying for whatever kind of machine, no matter if you're using it or not. So these are a few things, and this pattern, this theme of costs, uh, will come up over and over again in uh, this service discussion. So now we look at from the high-level concept to a concrete implementation how that service space uh, looks like. So again, as I said, the basic unit of compute is a single function. And if you want to have a definition for Twitter or for your boss who has an attention span of 15 seconds, then I suggest this one. It's a dynamically allocated resource environment for event-driven function execution. That's quite a, a mouthful. Um, and behind this dynamically allocation typically is an expectation of auto-scaling. So you don't worry um, about scaling up machines or number of containers or whatever. As the workload, as the traffic increases, the function just um, magically is, is scaled out. More instances of that function are executed. And I tried looking at all the different offers that are there to come up with a like generalization components that you would probably expect to find everywhere. And these are the three. You essentially start off with some kind of trigger. That trigger might be something like an infrastructure event. For example, you're uploading something to S3 and that triggers the execution of a function. One special kind of trigger uh, is time, right? And that reminds us of, of the good old crunch up, right? So you just say, trigger that function every two minutes or whatever. Then you have, and I'm very open to a better uh, label for that, the management part, which is essentially you load, upload your function, um, for example, as a, as a zip file or whatever the, the management interface is. You can configure things like resource consumption or whatever there. And you typically, providers have a number of different interfaces, a, an ICI where you can do clickety-click or CLI or HTTP API. And last but not least, very important and also the reason why typically public cloud deployments of, or public cloud offerings of serverless are, um, are very valuable are these integration points. Because the basic assumption around these functions that you're uploading there is that they are not only short running, but stateless. Right? So any kind of state that you're dealing with, you might have a chance to you know, write something to your local file system, but overall the function should be um, stateless. So to keep the state around, you will need integration points. You need to be able to, I don't know, put it on a queue somewhere, or um, again, storage or database or whatever. And that is also something that in the triggers is something where you see the biggest differences between the different offers. All right. Uh, Patrick, who is quite well known in the DevOps uh, domain, uh, made a quick survey. And, and as you can see, uh, what stands out is this function as a unit of deploy that uh, is appealing to many people. But coming in second is this no worries about servers. And this is something one could say, all right, we had that already with PASS, right? There you also didn't provision servers. But in a sense, it didn't really take off. Um, the third, uh, this instant parallel capacity, this is essentially what I mentioned earlier on as the auto scaling, right? You don't need to worry about scaling up something uh, that's got done automatically for you. And last but not least, the per request billing, as I mentioned, as you only get billed typically in a public cloud setup, uh, for the time the function executes, uh, you don't have to worry about something sitting around a virtual machine or whatever, uh, most of the time uh, idle and you still pay for it. Okay, in that ecosystem, as I said, AWS Lambda has been around the longest, 2014. There are a number of integration points and uh, triggers uh, available, and here you see the UI. Um, Azure Functions launched this year. Azure and Microsoft have been doing awesome stuff in that domain for a while, things like Microsoft Flow, for example, which is uh, equivalent to IFTTT, and other things have been there, but this Azure function is a kind of, um, yeah, a rewrite or a new product that pretty much matches to what you see in Lambda and in other areas. You got Google Cloud function, which is currently in alpha. Uh, I still need to figure out someone at Google to bribe to uh, give me access to it, so I didn't have a chance to play around with it yet. Um, 
but uh, yeah, again, launched earlier this year and um, hopefully uh, getting access to it. So there are other players that have been in that space for a while before it became cool and uh, who have adapted or changed their offering. Uh, Irona would be one example. There you also see the, the usage of, of containers, uh, at least in, in the back end, back, back end for, for executing the functions. There is Galactic Fog, um, again, a uh, very uh, new uh, thing, and the startup doing something that, that domain and, and very interesting offer, also not uh, that old. And there's IBM OpenWhisk, uh, open source uh, implementation. Um, there are certain dependencies there with Lumix and so on, but this is something that uh, is, in terms of um, yeah, maturity and so on, certainly um, more than comparable to AWS Lambda. And there are many, many more. There are uh, both hosted services as well as like Open Lambda, for example, um, open source implementations that now pop up and enrich that ecosystem. Sometimes it's something on top of AWS Lambda, sometimes it's a project that tries to unify certain aspects of, of these uh, different providers, but more or less you find uh, in, in every space something in just a handful a year. Now if you're really uh, on the bleeding edge, you say, oh, I'm gonna roll my own, I can point it to an example, a, a POC I did, um, that's the only time I probably mentioned DCOS in the talk, on top of DCOS, so we essentially have a um, couple of com containers. You can register a function, Python, so far the only runtime I'm um, supporting here. You then essentially have a template uh, of, a, of a Docker image that uh, supports the respective runtime, and then uh, you get a, a function ID returned, and that's the, the way how you can, in the second step, uh, engage that. So the containers in that setup are used to provide that isolation and also, uh, to a certain extent, um, having long-running uh, tasks there that you know, if you have requests uh, following in, subsequent requests following in that you don't need to spin up uh, new things, or you can spin it up quite, quite quickly. Okay, so we've learned a bit about what the basic elements are, and now we essentially jumping into where can they really, or should we want to apply that? There are a couple of application areas that, uh, if you think about the definition I gave you earlier on, are really good fits. So event-driven, short-running tasks, infrastructure tasks, that's where it more or less originates, uh, where um, reportedly also uh, AWS became the, or got the motivation in the first place, looking at how people would use EC2 instances and figure out quite often uh, the pattern would be reacting to an external or some kind of event. Uh, doing something uh, short-lived and then, uh, yeah, moving on. There are mobile and IoT applications. Uh, again, you always have that same pattern um, that you're reacting to a certain event, for example, a user checks into a certain location. Um, image processing, uh, any kind of, or, or ETL uh, data pipelines, any kind of batch processing, short-term short, short -term batch processing, uh, where it's not really that critical um, how, uh, yeah, what, what the, the uh, overall reaction time is. So there are a couple of use cases. Um, AWS has that li uh, listed there uh, from Seattle Times. They're essentially creating image thumbnails. Uh, so if someone loads up, uh, I don't know, a profile picture or whatever, or photo, um, a Lambda function on, on AWS Lambda is triggered, creates different versions or, or um, thumbnails out of that, and that is then pushed to uh, others in their social network, for example. This is a, an example of a, a startup in that space called uh, Teletext.io, and they essentially, um, their motivation was to write a kind of, provide a kind of CMS uh, based on Lambda. Um, if you want to learn more, I always provide the, the links to the respective stories, uh, medium blog posts, or whatever, down there. Um, and there you see the uh, source being the NamoDB, and um, at some point in time, if someone you know, visits a certain article or whatever, uh, through the Lambda function, um, the, the, the page and the data behind that is essentially generated on the fly. And the third example in that uh, area is a kind of migration story, where uh, a company um, took an existing workflow, or part of an existing workflow, and turned it into a Lambda application. Um, essentially calculating lineups for a certain game. Um, I found the story quite interesting because 
the person there actually reports quite in detail, not only on the um, yeah, operational aspects, but also in terms of the cost. So he claims uh, 30k page views for 0.21 dollars, which uh, seems quite interesting to me. And in case you want to dig deeper, again, put together a number of use cases there. Some of them um, are um, yeah, actually things that you can try out yourself, like the last one, uh, nowadays quite popular, Pokemon Go data, um, and, and others, there are uh, more examples available. Okay, so now we are all motivated, all run out and go for serverless. Uh, and that is where initially I said I want to have an open, frank discussion about serverless. I'm trying to make the point that serverless is not always a good fit. And that broken down over a couple of sub points. <laughs> the first thing you might want to ask yourself is in terms of the access pattern. So latency versus access frequency. So if we plot that, and you would have virtually these four quadrants. On the lower left side, you would have latency tolerant and low frequency access. So for example, looking back early on at the, the image processing, you don't really care um, how fast this new profile picture resize uh, is available at, at someone's site. Um, and you might only do that, I don't know, per user, uh, once a week or whatever. In the right upper corner, you have um, latency critical, high frequency access. So something, an endpoint that's hit, I don't know, 100,000 times per second, um, and you want to make or have guarantees that, I don't know, the 99 percentile is 100 milliseconds or whatever. And guess what? Serverless is a good fit for this lower left quarter. Right? So if you have relatively latency tolerant, you don't really uh, care too much about the absolute or variation of the, the latency and the respective function that, that is called is not called that often. The question comes from how to actually develop or go about developing functions. And there are things, a number of things that I would advise you to uh, take into consideration when you are evaluating an offer. Uh, for example, that would be the local development. I don't know if any one of you has ever developed with Google App Engine. Has anyone? Okay, so one nice feature I personally find is that you essentially have a more or less complete development environment locally. So you get to really test everything more or less out locally. That is quite often or almost never the case with serverless. So you need to uh, adapt your workflow there. The same goes for testing, load testing, whatnot. Version control, this function should be, uh, yeah, be uh, hopefully uh, stored in a distributed version control system. Uh, the question is how do you actually get that out to the respective provider? As I said, you typically have CLI and HTTP APIs there, so that shouldn't be a problem, but you should think about that. Uh, because it's relatively easy to start, and as you can see here, so that's again taken from Lambda, you have a couple of options. You can edit inline, which is probably fine if you use it, you know, as a single, uh, for a single use case, some infrastructure task. If you have many functions um, and many developers, you probably uh, want to use another way to deploy these functions. The second part, and that is more day two operations, um, everything around troubleshooting, figuring out why on earth has that function not triggered? Or it worked yesterday, Why? what has changed so that, so that it doesn't work anymore? And as you can see here, again, AWS Lander screenshot, um, from, from they, they provide a CloudWatch integration, and that is something that you typically get with all uh, other uh, public cloud uh, serverless offerings that you essentially, or they provide integrations with their own um, logging and, and monitoring platforms. The question here, we come back uh, at the very end of the presentation, is also who gets alerted when something goes wrong? One word of caution. I mentioned it earlier already. Um, the general expectation is that this function itself is stateless. Now, very often you will deal with state. You need to um, write something out to S3 or whatever. So just be aware of that, that you either make sure that your function is totally stateless, then you're fine, or you need to, again, that's part of the evaluation process, I would guess, to see what kind of integrations and what guarantees that come around that your respective provider 
um, actually gives you. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier one or already twice that most of the issues uh, and the thing that, that we've seen there, the convergence between dev and ops, um, are around not, not necessarily technology or, or technological things, but really organizational um, things that uh, you know, a certain challenge within the organization to adapt to new ways how to do things. So, very often in this context, serverless, you also hear the term no ops. And so this is my, my pet peeve. I really want to get rid of that term. Uh, we're already suffering from the term serverless, so let's not make it even worse. Um, Brian Lills from, from DigitalOcean came up with uh, ad ops and then, uh, yeah, riding on that bandwagon to, to make that more popular. The basic idea behind AppOps is that the person who writes an app or service or function in this case is also the person responsible for operating the application in prod. This sounds to some people like, yeah, sure, that's the, the clear thing to do, but think about the implication, what it means. And I would argue that a serverless environment is actually something that not only supports this AppOps paradigm, but almost forces it, right? You are typically, if you're writing code, the person that actually uh, gets to monitor and probably is also alerted to, to fix that service or that, that function. Just a, a word of uh, warning in this context. By app ops, I don't mean capacity planning, disaster recovery, especially if you roll out something uh, on premises. I really mean um, only the service of function-related parts. I believe, or I would suggest that the traditional ops team would be uh, in a new role in, in serverless, and that is a kind of coach. So if you think back to um, f uh, excess frequency versus latency, um, when is it a good thing, or, or I, I didn't provide any absolute uh, measures there, but when is it a good thing, when does it make sense uh, to go serverless, or maybe uh, something that started out serverless, moving back to a dedicated machine or container. And that is exactly the kind of insight that an ops team can provide to the developers, to the ad ops, to say, look, um, initially we thought that's a good idea to, to have a serverless implementation for that, but it turns out the access patterns have changed, uh, or whatever the reason is, or, um, yeah, utilization. You're actually, at the end of the day, paying more for, for that than if you would have a dedicated machine for that. And again, this, both, both these things, AppOps and the infrastructure team in that new role, this is really mainly an organizational challenge. No technology on earth can serve that, um, can solve that, and I can also, unfortunately, not provide any uh, good uh, yeah, recommendations there, other than uh, be open-minded, uh, try it out, and, and see where it goes. One more thing in that context, my big uh, hero there is Charity. Um, she runs a, uh, a startup and she has a number of uh, great resources, be it her blog, charity.wtf, uh, don't ask me what country that is, um, and a number of slide decks and so on around that. And if you're a developer or engineering manager, I really, really recommend that you check out her resources. This is really this uh, encouragement to uh, up the skill set of developers, what DevOps, what operation related things are necessary to make it a success. And as I said, I'm arguing for that serverless is essentially um, yeah, this, this uh, place where AppOps is really uh, happening as we speak. All right, last but not least, a uh, tiny plug. Um, I'm writing on a book called Serverless Ops uh, at O'Reilly. Hopefully later this year this will be available. It's a short book giving you a bit of an overview and a bit of uh, guidelines, especially from the operations perspective. If you uh, want to hit me up on Twitter um, or via email, always happy to discuss. And uh, with that, going over to Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Michael, yeah. um, you could say, uh, Lambdas and cloud functions are the best fit we currently have for a pay for what you use instead of pay for what you need. Uh, but you didn't discuss costs really in your story so far. That's right. Yeah. Oh, very, very good point. So essentially, 
I hinted at that, but uh, it's true that I didn't really go into detail here with this, right? So overall, typically within the, the public uh, offerings, uh, you essentially pay, um, you, you, you get to choose, you have certain parameters that allow you to choose the execution environment. So for example, you would say, I need, I don't know, I think the minimum in Lambda is 128 megs of, of RAM and an undisclosed amount of CPU shares, they don't really tell you how much, um, plus the second parameter that you can choose there is uh, the timeout, so how long do you expect that that serverless function runs. And if you look at that, um, that's why these two parameters, the, the latency and access frequency, uh, might be the, the two most important ones. If you have something that is really constantly um, invoked and uh, the, the latency um, is, is critical, then you're probably better off with uh, a dedicated machine or something, container on the virtual machine or whatever your setup is. Uh, the, the tricky thing there is uh, that there is no um, upfront way to know because you don't, unless you know, you have a very good idea of your workload, you, you can't really say where exactly the point is. There's one project out there um, called serverless calculator dot something, I think I have it in the resources, um, that allows you to uh, yeah, input and get, get a, an idea of how the costs are across different providers. But still, if you, especially the, for a new uh, use case or, or startup environment or whatever, where you don't yet know, um, you know, it might be a good idea to start off serverless, but then you see over, over time that um, you know, more and more people are using a specific service and uh, you're probably then better off with, with a dedicated virtual machine, for example. But uh, there are unfortunately no hard uh, guidelines around that. Uh, the best resource that I'm aware of is, as I said, this uh, serverless calculator website that allows you to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. If you can pass it on to gentlemen. Hey, I just wanted to mention in response to that, there is a project out there called JITSU. Um, it stands for Just In Time Summoning of Unikernels. It was a proof of concept around uh, unikernels where basically uh, a DNS, a serverless DNS server was created uh, and what it would do was, um, because the boot time for unikernels is so fast, um, it was meant as a, a proof of concept for unikernels. Every time a DNS request uh, hit this, this server, it would start booting unikernel, the unikernel would service the request and then kill it all within something like seven milliseconds. Right. So it's, it's definitely feasible. Um, to do even like high high request load, right? Um, it, it just you have to, you have to find something that's optimized for um, the the request rate that you're right. you're experiencing. I'm gonna check that out. Thank you very much. Sounds well, yeah, sensible yeah. to me. Uh, any more questions? Yes. I just wonder what you think of the term function as a service or files instead of serverless. Yeah, yeah. I I personally love it. As you noted, I didn't mention it because I somehow gave up on it, that it will ever be adopted. As I said, we are already punished with uh, serverless, but unfortunately, people by and large seem to you know, have adopted that pretty much similar with, with NoSQL. Uh, it is a misnomer, because of course there are servers. Um, I would love to see function as a service, and you know, if we all go out and establish function as a service, every time you say, want to see serverless, you say function as a service, um, it would be wonderful, but I think it's too late. It's also, that ship has sailed. I prefer function as a service, but even that's not quite right. It's really function running as a service, because you bring the functions, right? Yes, yes. There are like a couple of uh, approaches. I tried to suggest the flock of birds, which is uh, yeah even less interesting. But yeah, I think we're stuck with serverless. I'm afraid. Um, do you see um, DCOS or Mesosphere is playing <coughs> on this serverless um, uh, thing? Right. So I want to be clear, I don't know that person, but I didn't pay him, so <laughs> just make sure. Uh, in fact, yeah, there are um, offerings like Galactic Fog is uh, pretty much strongly depending on, on DCOS. We're working with the Iron Metal folks, um, starting uh, OpenWhisk, uh, they already have a Mesos uh, implementation as far as I gather. So, Yes, certainly. The, the question there is more, um, if you deploy something on your own, be it um, on-premises or in a cloud, right? Take, I don't know, OpenLander, which is early days, or OpenWisk or whatever, and you run it in your own cluster. You need to take care of the auto scheduling, 
I'm not saying that this is impossible, all I'm saying is it's tricky, right? You need to somehow, like, I mean, scaling instances, if you think about that example I gave you, the flock of birds uh, POC, where you essentially map one function to one container, scaling up the containers, the number of containers, the instances, the replicas, that's the easy part. But then, you know, you might have 10, 50 nodes or whatever in your, um, in your cluster there, um, can you actually make sure that like, you can scale the underlying infrastructure fast enough? That is why certain people argue that the true um, auto-scaling only is achievable through these public service offerings. But uh, yeah, we're certainly playing in that space, very interested in that space, um, but more as the underlying platform than providing something, some offering ourselves. Just coming back to the terminology thing, really, I've heard some people using serverless to also cover kind of hosted service things, so things like it's called Big Table, the Google thing where you can load up loads of data, or you know maybe even hosted database services, but in the sense that because you don't need to operate them. And I just wonder whether you think that should or shouldn't be included in serverless, because it's obviously very different from functional services. Right. So. It, it depends on if you agree with the definition or the expectation that a serverless function should be stateless or not, right? Um, so far, what I've seen, uh, all the providers uh, essentially encourage or enforce this fact, right? So what I would probably see in this setup, and, and AWS is certainly playing uh, you know, uh, uh, important role there and showing the direction it's going, you will have you know, databases and queues and whatnot as a service. And that's why, if you remember, these three components, the integration points, are so crucial. If you don't have that, you need to work around that to somehow get your state out there, uh, then yeah, you probably can't really use it in production. And, and I see these uh, yeah, hosted databases or whatever you have, um, they're uh, definitely playing together because in any serious application, if you think about you, your goal is to take a monolith and break it down uh, into hundreds and thousands of, of serverless functions. I'm not saying that this is a good idea, but if you want to do that, um, then you're running into all sorts of issues, whereas in microservices land, you typically have that coupled together. Uh, in serverless, you would have this, this clear separation of the stateless part would be mapped to serverless, and the state would be somewhere else, and the integration points that are really crucial. But uh, yeah, certainly, I would say for any non-trivial production use case, yeah, without data store queues and whatnot, probably not very useful. Unless you have a pure, purely mathematical function where you just say input, output, uh, such as in the use cases here we've seen sometimes. Any more questions? <coughs> no, we're missing okay. some. Yeah. That's it. Looking good. Big round of applause for Michael and please.